The next item of business is a statement by Michael Matheson on community justice in Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Michael Matheson. Cabinet Secretary, 15 minutes or thereabouts, please. Uh, President Officer, in the summer I launched this Government's vision and priorities for justice in Scotland, which laid out our intention to adopt a more progressive, evidence-based approach, supported by partners across the justice sector and beyond. This approach underpins our determination to ensure that we live in safe, cohesive and resilient communities. In a programme for Government published last week, we pledged to extend the presumption against short sentences to 12 months. This announcement was welcomed by former Justice Secretaries across the political spectrum who recognise that the time has come to adopt a more progressive and transformative perspective. It is a commitment consistent with our drive to create a more progressive, evidence-based justice system. This very week marks the 20th anniversary of the devolution referendum. In the intervening years, this parliament has done great things, and members across the chamber can feel greatly proud of their achievements. But one area in which we have made little progress is that of penal reform. In 1999-2000, the average daily prison population across Scotland's prisons was less than 6,000. During 2015-16, that figure was more than 7,600. That means that since the inception of this parliament, we, witnessed, we have witnessed an increase of nearly 30% in the number of people locked up on any given day. We know that short prison sentences do little to rehabilitate people or to, or to reduce the likelihood of their reoffending. We know that short-term imprisonment disrupts families and communities and adversely affects employment opportunities and stable housing. The very things that evidence shows support desistance from offending. We know that this is both a poor, poor use of public resources and a waste of human potential. There will always be cases in which the courts rightly take the view that a prison sentence is absolutely justified. But for those individuals who do end up in custody, we need to think beyond just bricks and mortar. That change is part of the rationale behind our plans for the female custodial estate. In July, I witnessed the start of demolition work on Cornton Vale Prison. The Scottish Prison Service have now commenced the planning and public consultation process for the creation of its replacement. Although located on the existing site of Cornton Vale, it will provide an entirely new approach for the custodial care of around 80 women. This new facility will run using therapeutic community principles and will incorporate gender-specific and trauma-informed practice, addressing the particular needs of the female prison population. For women who do not require the level of security or intensive intervention provided by the national facility, we will provide community custodial units. In July, I announced that the first two units would be located in Glasgow and either Fife or Dundee. I can today inform Parliament that the Scottish Prison Service has acquired a site in Mary Hill for the first unit in Glasgow and that the second will be in Dundee. These new community units will assist women to maintain their links with their family and accommodate them close to both their communities and the agencies that can ensure they're able to move away from offending. Work in these units will respond to the changing profile of the female prison population and the risk profile of women in custody. The Scottish Prison Service plan that these first two units and the national facility will be open by the end of 2020. This work is part of wider transformation within our prisons, professionalising the role of prison officers, ensuring a focus on rehabilitation and supporting the reintegration of people leaving custody. These developments are encouraging, but I would still like to see our criminal justice system 
have a stronger emphasis on robust community sentences that focus on addra addressing the causes of offending behaviour. In the 2008 report of the Scottish Prisons Commission, Henry McLeish wrote that in order to better target imprisonment and to make it more effective, it should be reserved, reserved for, and I quote, people whose offences are so serious that no other form of punishment will do, and for those who pose a threat of safe, serious harm to the public. This aim, will describe, this aim is described as a necessary touchstone of a society that wants to break with the idea that the only real punishment is prison. If we truly want to hold ourselves up as a modern and progressive nation, then I believe that this is the foundation that our community justice system needs to build on. The First Minister has made clear her ambition to build an inclusive and socially just Scotland. Your justice system has a crucial role to play in shaping that future and in helping to tackle social inequality. A just, equitable and inclusive society is one which needs to be supported by a progressive evidence-based justice system. A system which works across communities to reduce and ultimately to prevent further offending. A system which holds individuals to account for their offending, but which ultimately supports them to make positive contributions to our communities. Over the past decade, this government has taken steps to end our reliance on custody, a move towards effective community sentences that enhance public safety and promote rehabilitation. And the evidence shows are more effective at reducing reoffending and thus reducing the risk of further victims. When this government first came to power, more people were given custodial sentences than community sentences. Since then, there has been an increasing shift in favour of community sentences. The latest figures show that in 2015-16, over 5,000 more community sentences were imposed than custodial sentences. That's 5,000 more opportunities for individuals to pay back for their harm that they have caused. It's also fewer prison receptions taking up resources in our prison system and fewer people having to make the difficult transition from custody back into the community. That transition also happens for people held on remand, which is why the programme for government also outlines our continued backing for supported and supervised bail, helping individuals to remain in the community under supervision. This government will continue to promote the delivery of effective evidence-based interventions designed to prevent and reduce further offending. Our national strategy for community justice sets out our commitment to shifting criminal justice interventions upstream using the least intrusive intervention at the earliest point. It encourages justice partners to maximise opportunities for the appropriate use of diversion from prosecution to help address the underlying causes of offending and ensures people get access to drug, alcohol, mental health or other appropriate services. We remain committed to supporting local authorities in delivering robust community sentences that deliver tangible benefits for our communities. Funding for criminal justice social work remains at record levels. We invested an additional £4 million in community sentencing in 2016-17 and again in 2017-18. Last week, we announced legislation which would give our sentencers broader options and powers for using electronic monitoring. And just this morning, we published the analysis of a public consultation on our next steps. Electronic monitoring is already an important tool in the delivery of justice. It carries a punitive element and offers a range of options to improve public protection, while allowing an individual to maintain their employment and their family links. When used to enforce curfew conditions, 
it can provide stability to those whose offending is part and parcel of a chaotic lifestyle. The forthcoming legislation will expand the range of options and enable the use of new technology such as GPS. Sitting alongside community sentence, sentences, the presumption against short sentences uh, underlines our determination to move away from short-term custodial sentences. It is, of course, a presumption and not a ban. Sentencing discretion remains with the courts, and it is for the courts to decide the appropriate sentence based on the facts at hand. The purpose of the presumption is to ensure that short sentences are imposed when they are the only suitable option. As I have made clear, our vision for community justice is predicated on an evidence-based approach. That evidence shows that the use of very short sentences has fallen over the past decade. However, it also shows that we need to go further if we are to make a real impact on Scotland's high rate of imprisonment and the negative consequences of short-term sentences. That is why we consulted on a proposal to strengthen the presumption. The responses to the consultation were overwhelmingly supportive of an extension, and the vast majority of those who expressed a view favoured a presumption against sentences of 12 months or less. There was, however, a clear view that any extension of the presumption would need to be accompanied by a commitment to developing and resourcing community sentences, and concerns were voiced by a number of respondents over the need to ensure the court was able to take steps to protect victims, especially victims of domestic violence. Since the consultation closed, this government has worked with stakeholders across the justice sector to address these very concerns. In March of this year, I brought before this parliament the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill. This bill contains a number of provisions specifically designed to protect the victims of domestic abuse. It will ensure that when sentencing, courts are required to have regard of the needs to protect victims from further offences and contains provisions which will make it mandatory for the court to consider imposing a non-harassment order following a conviction. And of course, the bill contains the new domestic abuse offence, carrying a tough maximum sentence of 14 years, which will improve the justice system's ability to hold perpetrators of domestic abuse to account. These provisions place the safety of victims at the heart of this legislation, and I would urge members across this chamber to support this important bill in the coming months. And I can confirm that we will work in collaboration with Scottish Women's Aid to ensure that developments in electronic monitoring will improve the safety of women and children affected by domestic abuse. Signing officer, we have already taken steps to create a more progressive landscape for the delivery of community sentences, with our new model coming into effect on the 1st of April of this year. This model places decision-making locally with those who know their communities best, who understand the problems in their areas and who will be most affected by community justice issues. Under the new model, local planning, delivery and collaboration are complemented by national leadership and strategic direction provided by a new body, Community Justice Scotland. Community Justice Scotland will raise awareness of the benefits of community sentences and build public support. Working with community justice partners and stakeholders, it will drive improvement in service delivery in order to build safer, stronger and more inclusive communities. I believe that in combination, these measures address the concerns expressed by respondents to the consultation. That is why we will not we will only implement the extension to the presumption once the relevant provisions of the Domestic Abuse Bill are in force. Subject to approval by Parliament, I anticipate that the extended presumption will therefore be in place 
by the end of 2018. Sign officer, this government believes that extending the presumption is in line with their progressive approach to criminal justice policy. More than this, in concert with their ongoing approach to deliver safer and stronger communities, it's about being the progressive and socially inclusive nation we want to be. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in this statement. I intend to allow around 30 minutes for questions, after which we must move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if those members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak buttons now. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Claire Baker. Mr Kerr, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I do thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement. Let me make clear at the outset that I welcome parts of this statement. Uh, in particular, the expansion in use of new forms of electronic monitoring, something called for in my party's manifesto, and the general principles of the Domestic Abuse Bill. But there are areas of concern. Can the Cabinet Secretary really refer to the current system of community sentences as robust and effective when a third of community payback orders are never completed and some offenders are waiting over a year for their work placement to begin? And whilst the focus on reducing reoffending is welcome, will the Cabinet Secretary recognise that after 10 years of SNP government, the reoffending rate has barely shifted from where it was at the start of devolution, one in three? And to address this, will he agree that alongside a rigorous system of community sentences, we must also ensure that there is adequate work and purposeful activity in prisons and reverse his government's 300,000 hours cut in the last two years. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so let me try and address a few of these uh, issues that the members raised. And I welcome his uh, support for a greater use of electronic monitoring. I'm not entirely sure uh, what his uh, own party's views are on the type of electronic monitoring and how it should be used in uh, partnership with community sentencing, because we know that electronic monitoring used on its own is very ineffective. It's got to be part of a programme uh, that addresses individuals' offending behaviour. That's why we support the extension, and I'm certainly surprised that the member supports the idea of a greater use of electronic monitoring, but not a greater use of community sentencing, which is a key part of making it effective. And if you look at experience across Europe, that's exactly how it is made much more effective. And I also welcome his support for the domestic abuse bill, uh, which is a slight change in approach from uh, the previous justice spokesperson uh, for the Conservative Party. In the issue of uh, compliance with uh, the completion of community payback orders. Uh, the reality is that the completion of community payback orders uh, since they've been changed has actually increased uh, compared to the previous scheme uh, which was in place. Uh, so there has been an increase in compliance and the completion of these particular orders. But alongside that, the outcomes for them are better. Uh, when the member says that the reconviction rate hasn't changed, the reality is that the reconviction rate is at its lowest level in 18 years, which is a significant improvement and actually, surprisingly, I suspect the member isn't aware of this, it's actually better than any other part of the UK uh, compared to this issue. So that is important progress, and that's happened during the course of an increasing use of community payback orders. The reality is, uh, sign officer, uh, the approach that we are determined to take here in this government is one which is based on evidence. What is more effective in tackling the causes that drive someone's offending behaviour? And in doing that, effectively, we can reduce the risk of these individuals committing offences again in the future. All of the evidence, not just here in Scotland, but internationally, demonstrates that community payback orders and community sentencing is much more effective than short-term prison sentences. And if we get that right, then we can reduce the risk of offenders committing offences again in the future. And that's exactly what we're going to be taking forward. And that's why... In Scotland, recorded crime is also at a 42-year low. We have a very strong track record in how we deliver justice in this country, and the track record we have over the last 10 years in changing the way in which we are delivering community sentencing is also demonstrating the benefits that come from that, and that's what this programme of work will take forward. Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for advance copy of the statement. There is much we can agree on and we support the need for prison reform and the important role that community sentencing can play. But there are a couple of points I wish to raise. 
The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that crimes currently given less than 12 months sentencing include handling offensive weapons, assault, some violent crimes and domestic abuse. Scottish Labour's manifesto committed to an increase to six months. He will need to work hard to convince the public of the merits of his argument, particularly those who have been victims of crime, crimes which are often very distressing and even life-changing. And can I ask if he has given enough so far to convince the women's aid of these plans? Uh, the existing presumption at the moment does not mean an end to sentencing of up to three months. I constantly hear that there's a lack of confidence within the courts for the community options. And that a sentencing option will often be taken because it's seen in the best interest of the convicted as well as the victim. Community options are often underfunded, patchy in provision and can be open to abuses. We are all familiar with reports about the level of breaches and stretched resources. How will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that community options are properly resourced and that they provide a robust alternative that victims can have confidence in and deliver a system that puts the protection of the public first? Cabinet Secretary. So, no, so I think uh, picking up on the uh, latter part that the member made around the confidence around community sentencing, I agree that's extremely important. And it's been a long-standing issue around making sure that our, uh, uh, our sentencers have confidence in the community disposals which are to hand. And we know from some of the research work that's been carried out is that sentencers do have greater confidence in the community payback scheme that we now have in place compared to the previous scheme. And that was part of the review which was carried out in 2015, identifying that from our sentencers. But we need to make sure we build on that uh, and continue to have our senders having a uh, confidence in that process. That's why we've provided that extra four million pounds to our local authorities to deliver further community sentence programmes uh, and to extend the range of programmes which are available. We've now provided that over two financial years and we'll consider that uh, going forward because it's an area of priority that I recognise is important in expanding the range of options that are there and also to make sure that our senders have confidence in them. But over and above that, if the public are to have faith in the greater use of community sentences, they must be effective in delivering better outcomes. And just today, I was in Dunfermline in Fife looking at the Wings project, which is delivered there by the local authority. It was initially set up by funding that came from the Scottish Government around changing our approach to female offending. And the outcomes from that project have been really positive. It's a demonstration of local policy uh, being taken forward by a local authority, making a real difference in tackling offending behaviour amongst young people. And it has the confidence of sentencers who make use of that. Can I turn to the issue, though, around some of the specific offences which you made reference to? For example, the average custodial sentence for handling uh, offensive weapons has more than doubled in the last 10 years. It has gone from 160 days in 2006 7 to 365 days in 2015 16. And for some of the other areas as well, including domestic violence, um, very often uh, sentences have increased over the last 10 years for these particular offences. But it's also important to recognise the presumption is exactly that. It is a presumption. If a sentencer still believes an individual for any of these offences should actually have a period in custody, then that option will remain open to them and it will be their choice to make that decision. So it's important to recognise that although sentences have been increasing for a range of the crimes that the member actually made reference to, it's also got to be recognised, even with a presumption, the sentencer will still have the right to be able to impose a custodial sentence if they believe that's the most appropriate measure that should be applied. Uh, thank you. I have 13 members wishing to ask questions. I have 20 minutes. You can do the arithmetic. So could I ask for succinct questions, please? I first call Fulton McGregor, followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the steps taken by this government in recent years to tackle domestic abuse, including bringing forward the new legislation. Given this and that increased awareness and reporting of such offences is likely to lead to a higher rate of conviction and community payback orders, what steps is the government taking to ensure that resources are made available to effective, specifically around domestic abuse, rehabilitation programmes to reduce the risk of reoffending? I must give a definition of succinct sometime. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, we are taking forward a range of measures to uh, support the uh, organisations that work with women uh, who experience domestic abuse, including uh, uh, providing an extra £20 million from the justice portfolio 
over the course of the last three years to support some of these measures. Part of that includes, the, for example, extending the programme of the uh, Caledonian programme, tackling uh, those who perpetrate uh, domestic abuse in order to uh, change their uh, behaviour. But alongside that, the measures which were put in the domestic abuse bill with the mandatory requirement to consider uh, a non-harassment order in order to protect uh, women who have experienced domestic abuse. But as I also mentioned in my statement, we are also going to be looking at how electronic monitoring can be used to help to support uh, women who have experienced domestic abuse as well. And that's one of the pilot projects that we'll look at taking forward uh, on electronic monitoring with Women's Aid in Scotland. Margaret Mitchell, followed by Rona Mackay. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary in this statement makes no reference to those at risk of um, offending, many of whom do so as a result of debt. Is he aware of CAP Debt Counselling, which works Scotland-wide, helping those in crisis with debt? And can he outline how the Scottish Government will raise awareness about the work of voluntary and third sector organisations like CAP Counselling, who do so much to identify and support those in risk of offending? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so, officer, I recognise that debt is a, an issue that can, uh, uh, that can blight many uh, individuals and family uh, households. And there's a range of measures which the uh, Scottish Government take forward in working in partnership with agencies to tackle issues of debt and also to make sure that individuals receive the right advice and information uh, to assist them in addressing any issues uh, of debt. Uh, however, uh, given a very specific project which the member uh, raised, I'll ask my uh, Cabinet colleague, uh, Angela Constance, who is responsible for this area of uh, policy, to write to the member setting out exactly the measures that have been taken forward to support these types of organisations. Uh, I think it was connected to the statement in that it may lead people into crime and so on in conviction. I think that was the link you were making, yes. Because uh, I saw a little frown on your face. Uh, Rona, Rona Mackay, followed by Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. What impact will the presumption against short sentences have on the Scottish Prison Service? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presiding, uh, presiding Officer, the impact of uh, the presumption against short sentences uh, moving to 12 uh, months uh, on the prison uh, population will be dependent on how uh, sentences choose to uh, take that forward. So, for example, if there's a greater use of uh, community sentencing, that could result in a reduction in the number of individuals who then receive short-term prison sentences of less than 12 months. What we have saw, since the, pres the presumption has moved to three months, is that we have saw a reduction in the number of people who have received sentences um, of under three months. It would be reasonable to anticipate that we would see a reduction in the overall prison population uh, should uh, more of our sentences choose not to sentence someone to custody for less than 12 months and to make use of a, a community disposal instead. However, that will be entirely dependent upon uh, how our judiciary uh, choose to take that forward. Thank you, Mary Fee, followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With local authorities and partner agencies on the ground taking on a, a greater role in community justice, will the Cabinet Secretary provide an assurance today that Scotland's councils, which have seen budgets cut year after year by his government, will they give an assurance that they will receive funding for community justice that matches the real cost of delivering effective and meaningful community sentences, as COSLA have highlighted? And can he also confirm when the funding formula for community sentences will be announced because he's not done that today. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so, enough, so the funding formula for the allocation of resources has already been published. It was uh, published earlier this year as it was agreed with COSLA and the COSLA leader, leadership group. Uh, it was applied to this financial year. So that's already uh, an area that has been agreed. Uh, I should just point out to the member is that community justice, uh, community justice uh, uh, budgets have actually been protected uh, during the whole course of the last number of years under this government. And in fact, we have increased them with the extra £4 million that we've put in over the last uh, two years to them. But the community justice social work budgets have been ring-fenced for some time and we continue to protect them. And that's why, with this additional £4 million over the last two years, we have record funding going into uh, community justice programmes. But I should also point out uh, that the support for community justice programmes is not just funding that goes to local authorities. Uh, so, for example, we support a range of organisations such as SACRO, APEX, uh, Shine Mentoring, etc., who provide services right across the country, who are national service providers within the third sector. Uh, and we've been increasing our level of funding available to them to provide these types of services uh, going forward over the last couple of years. Thank you, John Finney, followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, 
Cabinet Secretary reference was made to the resource allocation model, some community disposals require a certain cohort of personnel involved to make them viable. Can you advise whether the resource allocation model reflects that and thereby ensures that uh, offenders in rural areas aren't disadvantaged over offenders in urban areas? Please. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, the member raises an important point and it's, it is worth uh, re-emphasising to, uh, to Parliament is that the resource allocation model which is now in place is one which was agreed by local authorities in Scotland in partnership with the Scottish Government. Uh, so we've taken this forward on a co-production basis. Uh, so that it's designed to try and help to support local authorities as best possible. What we have also said is that the transition will be over a five-year period so that there is no marked financial disadvantage to the reallocation of resources. And a specific part of the resource allocation model is to ensure that the resources which are allocated to local authorities are, reflected, are reflective of the real need within that community. Uh, so it should ensure that our rural communities where there is a real need is better reflected in how funding is allocated to local authorities going forward because there were concerns about the previous model which was largely focused on allocation to our main central belt local authorities and this allows for a greater, more effective distribution of that funding across all local authorities in Scotland reflecting local need. Liam McCarter, followed by Graeme Day. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of his statement for the Liberal measures uh, within it and to his response there to John Finney's question, I very much uh, appreciate. He's referred to COSLA and SACRO, but both of those are pointing to the um, significant expansion needed in provision and therefore the real cost of the additional resources that will need to be put in. Is he aware of that and what assurances can he give COSLA, SACRO and others that those resources will be committed by the Government? Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, I do recognise that as we uh, see a, a, a reduction in the number of individuals who receive a custodial sentence, that we will have to see a greater expansion of uh, community disposals. Uh, that's why uh, two years ago I took a decision to increase the allocation of resources to uh, community-based programmes to allow them to start to expand and to uh, develop. What I would anticipate as we see uh, some of the changes within our overall prison population is a freeing up of some of the resources that are presently tied down to our custodial estate, which I would then seek to look at reallocating into uh, community-based uh, programmes. That is a process which I said we've already started uh, with the £4 million increase over the, last, uh, the course of the last two years, and I will continue to look at how we can have an incremental increase in that as we go uh, forward. But importantly, uh, it's not just about increasing funding to local authorities. It will also be about making sure that we have third sector organisations such as SACRO and others able to support some of that work um, across the country uh, through some of the national programmes which they, uh, they deliver. Graeme Day, followed by Maurice Corey. Uh, thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the important work carried out by existing community-based uh, services targeted specifically at female offenders. The Goyan Iowa project based in my constituency is one very good example of this. Can the Cabinet Secretary expand on the role he envisages such projects having going forward? Cabinet Secretary. I'm, officer, I'm aware of this particular project and the value which has come from it. Uh, the member may be aware, particularly around uh, working with uh, female, off female offenders, that we had the uh, uh, the, we had the change fund which was there to support uh, the initiation of some of these services within uh, local communities. What we didn't do was impose a particular type of model for working with female offenders. We wanted that to be developed at a local level and Angus was one of the areas that took forward a model uh, which was reflective of their, the local community's needs. The purpose behind the funding which we put into place was to help to support that model being developed and then for that to be mainstreamed within the local authority area and some of the local authorities have now taken that forward. There's absolutely no doubt from what I witnessed today in the way in which Fife Council have taken it forward, which has been very impressive with the WINGS project, just demonstrates how successful that type of approach can be. Uh, and the project which the member makes reference to in Angus is another example of that type of success. So I see these projects as being key to the ongoing work in changing the way in which we deal with female offenders. But equally, with the change in the female custodial estate, I actually recognise that there will need to be a greater tie-in between some of these projects and also the new female custodial units. 
uh, when individuals are being released from them back into the local communities. But having them closer to hand, uh, which I've no doubt is Dundee is much closer to Angus than that of Compton Vale, it will help to facilitate that type of partnership working, which will be absolutely crucial to help to reduce the risk of these individuals when they go back into the community, to be able to actually settle back in and to become productive members of a local community. Maurice Corrie, followed by Ben McPherson. Uh, <coughs> Deputy Presiding Officer, can the Cabinet Secretary offer any reassurance to those communities and victims of crime living in Maryhill and Dundee who may have concerns about the safety of their new, the new community custodial units? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, I recognise the issue which your member has uh, raised. I'm sure he will recognise uh, our determination to fundamentally change the way in which we tackle the whole issue of female offending. Uh, but what I think is also worth noting is that I think there is a danger, uh, and I say just a danger, that some people may choose to try and turn it into a political football on the basis of the location of where some of these facilities will go. This is a transformational approach to tackling female offenders in Scotland and those who come into our custodial estate. And I would hope there would be cross-party support right across this chamber for that change in model and the benefits that can come from female custodial units. Because we know from the Angelina report that looking at female custodial uh, uh, issues that uh, smaller units within local communities closer to the community where the individual came from and the services that will support them once they go back into the community is much more effective in reducing the risk of their offending behaviour again in the future. And of course, these units will be for individuals who are of low risk but I certainly hope that across this chamber there would be cross-party support for that change in model and to provide assurances to communities this is about delivering greater safety within uh, the whole issue of working with female offenders rather than increasing risk. Ben McPherson, followed by Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I strongly welcome today's statement because it is widely accepted that community justice helps reduce reoffending. However, what action is the Scottish Government also taking to reduce the chances of those given custodial sentences from reoffending? Cabinet Secretary. So, and also one of the uh, benefits, I believe, from uh, reducing prison population is that it will increase capacity uh, within our prison service to tackle the causes of those who have committed serious offences much more effectively. Uh, you just have to look at the conditions and the situation in England and Wales, where there is just complete chaos in the prison estate. And one of the major problems they have as a result of that is that they are not able to deliver effective rehabilitation programmes to any great degree. And part of the challenge which we have in Scotland is that we still have a large part of the prison services resources are taken up by the churn of short-term prisoners moving through the system. That takes up a disproportionately large amount of the prison system's resources. If some of those resources can be released, and some of the capacity that comes from that is released, it allows us to focus more of those resources on tackling some of the issues of the serious offenders who are within our custodial estate, while at the same time allowing us in the future to move some of that resource into the community setting as well. So that's one of the real potential benefits we have in reducing our prison population. I hear members who say what we need to do is just have more rehabilitation within our prisons. The reality is that for short-term prisoners, from the time of being uh, inducted into the prison and then by the time they're actually leaving, it is a very short window to actually address any form of offending behaviour. And anyone who has any knowledge of the approach to rehabilitation would recognise trying to do that effectively in such a short period of time is quite frankly almost impossible to do. And that's why if we are to deliver effective rehabilitation, it's better that it's targeted at those who are in prison for a longer period of time and taking a community-based approach which is much more effective in tackling offending behaviour. Mark Griffin, followed by Claire Hockey. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary has rightly spoken about the impact imprisonment has on employment opportunities and stable housing, which is likely to increase rates of reoffending. Can I ask in what discussions the Cabinet Secretary and the officials have had around the new social security powers and social security agency and what practical support they would be offering offenders who are just about to be released from prison? Cabinet Secretary. So, and also the member raises a very important uh, issue because one of the real challenges for individuals being liberated from prison is issues around housing and also 
issues around welfare and employment, which is one of the reasons why we also set out in the programme for government need to make sure that we have a greater provision of supervised bail uh, and other bail options uh, rather than remand, because we know effectively that allows someone, if they are in employment or have housing, for that to be maintained uh, until the point of the matter reaching court and sentence being imposed there after. I've already had discussions uh, and there is ongoing work within government, both with uh, Jean Freeman and with Kevin Stewart, looking at how we can align the new social security powers we have to better meet the needs of some of those who are being liberated from prison. So, for example, one of the real challenges around the DWP's changes to uh, universal credit uh, was that you had to be able to apply for it online. The challenge was, was in prison and you had to have an address uh, before you could apply for it. Well, for many individuals who are in prison, they didn't have an address and they didn't have access to a computer to be able to facilitate that, which created problems right from the very outset, which meant very often they were being liberated without having access to benefits. So we've already been doing work internally in government to look at how we can address those very specific measures that would help to support an individual getting into housing, but also being able to get access to welfare at the point when they're liberated from prison. And ministers within government have already engaged in that process with the Scottish Prison Service to look at how we can deliver that much more effectively going forward. Claire Hawkey, followed by Gordon Linhurst. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide more detail about which groups took part in the consultation on the presumption against short sentences and what evidence they gave to support this position? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Signing Officer, the uh, feedback we received for, from the, uh, for the consultation is now, has been uh, published, but it ranged from organisations from uh, COSLA through to experts within the justice sector, uh, within the academia, uh, uh, the academic world, to those uh, within SACRO, APEX, through to, uh, through to the Howard League, uh, and uh, a range of individual local authorities as well. Uh, so there's a wide range um, of organisations. I should also mention uh, Scottish Women's Aid and some of the other organisations that work with women who have experienced domestic violence. That's also why, uh, officer, when members were raising the issue about when would we publish our uh, views on the responses to the consultation, uh, I made it very clear at that time that we were working through the responses which we had received, and in particular the concerns that had been raised by a couple of those stakeholders, particularly uh, Scottish Women's Aid, and I set out in my statement the measures which we have taken forward in order to address the concerns uh, which they had raised uh, during the course of the consultation. But it is worth keeping in mind uh, that there was uh, overwhelming support from those who responded to the consultation uh, to moving the presumption against short sentences moving to 12 months. Gordon Lindhurst, followed by Emma Harper. Last question. I welcome the commitment to a system which works with communities to reduce and ultimately prevent further offending. Um, I'm just wondering, I also recognise the comments about those who are on short-term sentences, but we have something like uh, 1,000 plus prisoners currently in the Scottish prisons who are not engaged in what the guidelines refer to as a purposeful activity. I'm just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary can give an indication of what specific measures are being looked at to try and address that specific issue for those who do remain in prison. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, um, there's a, the review of purposeful activity was carried out by uh, the SPS and they're already taking forward a range of measures to change the way in which activities are delivered within, uh, within uh, the prison estate. I must re-emphasise, though, the issue about the idea of purposeful activity in working with short-term uh, prisoners. There are probably in the region of around 4,000 short-term prisoners go through the Scottish prison estate in the course of any year. Put that in context of the fact that we have around 7,000 to 7,500 prisoners in the system uh, over the course of a year just demonstrates the number of short-term prisoners that they are working with. Many of whom will present with alcohol and drug, uh, mental health issues uh, that need to be addressed. What the Scottish Prison Service will do is they will seek to try and address these issues as best they can within that short period of time. But the member will recognise that when someone actually comes into prison with many years, possibly many decades of problems with alcohol and drugs and mental health issues, it's almost impossible for the prison service to address that within a six month or seven month period. The reality is, to deal with those issues, you need a much longer period of time in order, to, in order to address them much more effectively. And one of the big problems that undermines the prison service being able to work more effectively with other prisoners who are in for more than a year is the churn of short-term prisoners that takes up a disproportionate amount of the prison service's resource. 
And if we can free up some of that capacity, it will allow them to give greater focus to purposeful activity and other appropriate interventions while someone is in prison, while at the same time allow us to use these resources in the community, which are much more effective in dealing with the underlying causes that drive offending behaviour, such as alcohol, drug and mental health issues, which we know can be much more effectively addressed when someone's in a community disposal. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that enabling female offenders to maintain links with their families will not only benefit them, but will often benefit the families, potentially reducing the chances of children becoming involved in crime as they grow up? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the member raises, again, a very important point, which was one of the key issues that was highlighted by the Angelini report, highlighting in particular the it break in family link. It can have a, the, a break in anybody's family link during the period of custody. It can have a, a very significant impact on that family. But in particular, it can have a very negative impact on any children in that family. And there is a growing body of evidence that show that adverse childhood events such as parental imprisonment can have a very significant impact on that child's development in the future with an increasing risk that they end up getting involved in the criminal justice system themselves. So we have to listen to the evidence in this matter, and it's clearly an issue uh, which we know can also damage children affected by parental imprisonment. But we've now put additional resources in place to allow uh, a range of uh, family contact centres to be provided at our prisons. We now have a living in place. I opened the most recent uh, at Glen Oakle, which is there to support that contact between uh, family and prisoner. But the reason we have moved to a model around the female custodial estate, which is these smaller community custodial units, is to allow women to then be placed in custody much closer to their family to be able to maintain those contacts more effectively. But also, when they actually leave that establishment, the services that are there to actually support them and assist them are the services that have been assisting them while they were actually in the community unit as well. That's a model which we know can be much more effective in helping to support women who do find themselves in custody, but we also know it can help to support the family more effectively and reduce the risk that it exposes children who experience a period of their parent being in custody. I believe that will achieve better outcomes in the future, but also, importantly, it will also prevent these individuals committing further offences again in the future, because family contact is a key factor in promoting desistance. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That ends questions. The Cabinet Secretary will allow a minute or so for the front bench to take their places in the next debate.